uh, this day presentations. We are getting now to the final speaker, final keynote speaker. But uh, before that, please allow me to make uh, some small announcements. Uh, as you said from the mayor uh, words, in Timisoara there are works. Timisoara is modernizing, but there are also good things coming with that. So this morning, uh, somebody cut down the optical fiber, uh, the main optical fiber, so we don't have uh, the, the normal internet connection. We used to call a stupid worker, which is not thinking to what he's doing, Dorel, and we say Dorel was hitting again. So uh, we don't have our normal internet connection. Anybody in the university has it. We manage in the morning to sort it out to have a reserve line, but it is limited in terms of band. So if every one of you will try to get connected at the same time, you can expect some delays and some problems. Uh, unfortunately, we cannot promise that it's going to be solved this morning, probably only in the afternoon or uh, even uh, later on. So please uh, accept this with our apologies, but it's nothing depending on us. Uh, Martin will use for his presentation a mobile hotspot, and uh, all those in the European Union can do the same, because since the 1st of July, the cost of the roaming are the same as in your country. So, at least, this is the good part. And now, as we finish with that uh, bad news, uh, let me introduce our uh, final keynote speaker, which is Martin Dugiamas. He's coming from Australia. Martin is the founder of the Moodle project and also the CEO of Moodle. Uh, he is uh, having a vision and an open mind about education. His vision is to make education uh, free accessible to everybody, to be able to use it from anywhere. So probably all of you are already familiar with Moodle as one of the main platforms, probably the most used open source platform in education. But he's working now in things about doing it even friendlier for research, for other application, through different other uh, initiatives like uh, Moodle Academy, Moodle Cloud, Moodle Connectivity, and so on. So please let me give the floor to Martin, who will tell you more about that. Martin, please. Thank you, Radu. Good morning. Uh, thank you for getting up and coming in here so uh, early, because uh, I know how hard that is. So um, uh, I have a lot. I think I have like 90 slides, so I'm breaking all the rules. But as you'll see, it won't be so, uh, it won't be so hard to follow. Uh, I... Um, I'm very pleased to be here because normally I talk at Moodle conferences, at Moodle Moots, but I've been making a conscious effort to get out and, and, uh, and go to different conferences and meet different people. And it's been really good to be here and, and have the conversations we've been having the last few days. So I'm from Perth, Australia, or as we normally have it in Perth, that's how we, that's how we see things. Um, and I grew up here right in the middle of Australia, uh, uh, learning on shortwave radio. So my teacher's about a thousand kilometers away. There's no internet in the 70s. Uh, we were using shortwave radio bounces off the atmosphere and then down again. So it's about a thousand kilometers to my teacher. And uh, that area of my classroom was about the size of Spain. That's what the places I lived in looked like. Very red desert, uh, very remote. I was the only non-Aboriginal child in most of the places where I lived. And that's why I was doing school that way. Every two weeks, an aeroplane would come with my homework. And every morning, I was on the radio talking with a class. So we got very used to making uh, the small bandwidth 
uh, be as large as possible. And, and efficiency was really something we were always thinking about. But I wanted to talk to you today about what is something I really like to do out there, which is building fires. So I love camping, I love being outside. Anyone here who like camping or you building fires? Who likes fires? Who likes making fires? Admit it. So I, like, I really like to make fires. I, I can stare at a, f a fire for hours. And when you make a fire, you start with something very small. Right? You need to light it very small. And then you add some bigger wood. And you add some bigger wood. And maybe a, a British SAS commando. And eventually you can make a fire very large from a very small beginning. It's about this uh, feeding a fire with fuel and growing it. So I built this fire um, starting in uh, 99 was my very first prototypes. And Moodle is now around the world. These are the registered sites, about 81,000. Most people who use Moodle don't press the registration button, so we don't even know them. How many people here use Moodle? Can I have some hands? OK, it's pretty much everybody. Uh, it's a lot of responsibility now on the project. And uh, my job is to make sure that this thing is sustainable and that it's going in the right direction. And I calculated recently we've put about $50 million into Moodle to make that software. A couple of million lines of code. Uh, we have never had an investor. We have never been in debt. So my role has been how to make this project grow sustainably uh, and consistently. You can see the US has the most Moodle sites, but the country that actually has the most Moodle sites per person, does anybody want to guess? Anyone? Some guesses? It's not on, the, I, it's not on this picture. Have a guess. Slovenia. I don't know why, but uh, it's really high. Like it's, it's two or three times more than any other country. Spain is very high and uh, Brazil, these countries, and I think here too in Romania, it's like 90% uh, of uh, higher ed and K-12. And Moodle is also used a lot in workplaces. Some very large companies use Moodle. For some reason, all the oil companies use Moodle. I don't know why. They're very rich. They could afford anything they wanted. I think it's obviously the open source nature of the software and the way they can make it what they need to make it. So in Europe, uh, in general, it's about two-thirds of uh, the higher ed uh, is using Moodle. So what's new? Well, before I talk about Moodle, I want to talk about what's new in the world. These are some of the biggest problems that we're facing right now as a species on this planet from the UN website. Uh, these are the big problems, I like to call them. So we have massive, increasing inequality. The gap between rich and poor is getting wider and wider and wider. Food, water security has, you know, we've always had some problems, but it's getting, in some parts of the world, really seriously wrong. And yet, in a place like Europe, 45% of food is wasted. The average household in Australia uh, throws $3,000 worth of food into the rubbish into the, every, every year. There's a refugee crisis. We've got 65 million people who are displaced. We have climate change, and we have uh, climate change deniers. We have data privacy and ownership problems. Who owns the data? Who, well, these devices we're all using, who's producing them and who's controlling them? Automation. A lot of us are working on some sort of automation, but when that gets into the real world and affects jobs and the economy, you know, how do we manage that process? What's, the, uh, what's the res our responsibility there? Healthcare quality is, even in the US, is a, probably the major issue right now. This is one of the richest countries in the world, and they can't get healthcare right. Education quality. And that's where Moodle really, you know, it's the thing we're focusing on. But I think education actually affects every single one of these. If 
people uh, could understand science, if people could understand other cultures and other countries, a lot of these things uh, might have a chance of being solved. The inequality one in particular is really interesting to me. There is a, I saw just recently some uh, work that was done showing that private wealth, the, so the, the very rich people who are investors, uh, very old families and so on, uh, this private wealth is growing faster than the economy. When they invest in something and get a return, the return they're getting is faster than the whole economy is growing, which means that the percentage of the total economy is more and more concentrated in a few hands. And I saw a statistic that now five richest people in the world have the same wealth as the lowest 50% of the entire planet. So that, that is a trend that's going in one direction and it seems unstoppable. So where, where are we in 100 years? Are we all working for five people? The Silicon Valley model that, that most of us rely on to have these devices and the, and the, uh, the software engineering tools that we're using, I mean, most of the things on these devices are coming from companies operating under that model, are uh, um, they're basically profit-based entities. And the profit, the, the investors that are driving these are these wealthy people I was talking about. The problem is this model is very one-sided. It's going in one direction. We can't replicate the same model everywhere else. We cannot have everybody making those sort of profits. There's not enough resources in the world. So that's why there's only really one Facebook. You know, there's a few other, you know, uh, uh, things around. But it, things seem to be concentrating and concentrating. And so to actually have this as a model for how things should work is not correct. And so when they, they usually talk about disruption and competition and replacing. But I prefer to talk about supporting, nurturing, and improving. The systems that we have set up now, the systems that most of you are working in, the universities, you know, in the education system, universities and schools, instead of replacing the output of these organizations with a commercial for-profit model, we need to be making the infrastructure work better so that it can provide for the world, so that we can be building our infrastructure through a more equitable model, right? And the open movements of the world are trying to tackle that. The open movements are trying to find ways for all of us to share knowledge, tools, uh, uh, techniques, workflows, um, so that we can all benefit. And so I get back to the Moodle project and why the Moodle project exists. Because it is a project that is not designed around profit. It's designed around this mission. It's desi designed around the mission of empowering educators to improve our world. And it's very explicitly saying educators. We don't say uh, we are trying to educate the world directly or bypass the universities and schools. We don't say we're trying to uh, uh, have uh, the best learning, necessarily. We're about empowering educators, giving them tools so that they can do their job and be more effective at it. It's simply impossible to create an education agenda for the world. Every country has its own things, every school, every teacher has its own things, and we have to trust them to know what's best. And the vision is we're trying to make the most effective platform. And that's from a software engineering point of view and a human uh, interface point of view. We're trying to make the tool that is the most effective. So you put the least work in and get the most results out. And that's so one teacher can reach uh, greater numbers of students or a large number of students with more uh, effectiveness, so more quality learning. 
And we have five values in the Moodle project. And values are very important, because this is about the why and the how are you doing things. So we, we value education at all levels. We have education in the whole project. We have openness. We have respect between people and between us and competitors. We're not trying to take down the world or disrupt. We're trying to uh, build something that, that people can respect and we respect others. We have integrity, so we focus on things like ethics and privacy and innovation. We try and provide a place where everybody can innovate. So um, the reason I'm telling you all this is because I'm, I'm making an argument here for Moodle as something that I think you should all uh, be participating in. If you look at the world of software out there, there's a lot of logos and a lot of apps and a lot of attempts and a lot of very interesting ideas. So Moodle's place in all that is the thing that focuses on the intersection of those things. It's very specifically uh, between the administration of an institution, the users, groups, roles, uh, departments, courses, competencies, and an API around all of that so it can integrate with everything else. And this core learning platform, we have plugins on it. The plugins let it integrate with other systems and it let it, let, let it be expandable. And we have something like 1,200, 1,300 uh, plugins written by the community. And that whole system is accessible via desktops, uh, via mobile devices. We're now working with virtual reality and the voice interfaces of the future, which are coming. A lot of things, are, the voice is starting to uh, come in. You probably tried talking to your phone or if you've got one of those home devices. They're starting to get good. They're, they're still in the uncanny uh, valley there where they don't quite do the job, but they are getting there. And um, all of these things can be ways of accessing Moodle, uh, but the fundamentals of what Moodle is are not going to change very much, and they don't really need to. And then in the end you have a course, and a course is just a sequence of these plugins, a sequence of activities and resources, and that's how you make a, an experience, a sequence of activities. So, summarising that, we've got a, a, a project that's driven by a mission, not by profit. It enables sharing of plugins, of content, of ideas. It enables savings, so we have efficiency and we can focus on the bigger problems. And lastly, it enables science. And this is what I really wanted to get to today, is the science of using Moodle. Because for me, Moodle is a place where you make your own fires. You can actually create experiments with the students. Um, and by doing that, you've actually achieved a little bit of truth in the world. So a lot of people are using Moodle for, uh, how many people here have used Moodle as part of a research project, actually? Can I have some hands here? All right, it's about half of you. Um, because it's open, because all the data is there, you can analyze the data, you can change the code, you can try crazy new things, and that's exactly the sort of innovation that, that we are trying to promote. I have been going to some conferences recently and I see Moodle being used, and they have a, someone has a theory, uh, you know, a hypothesis, and that's how papers usually start. And uh, you take that and then you, you implement it and in practice and you see the results and then you have some, some results of that. One of my favourite quotes ever is, uh, in theory, theory and practice are the same, but in practice they're not. There is something better than practice though. There is widespread practice. It's not enough to simply have a theory, try it out, see how it's going, uh, and, and at the end of the paper go, yes, it succeeded or it didn't succeed, uh, and wipe your hands of it. Like, and just, just publishing it in proceedings is not necessarily going to go anywhere. So I really want to promote this idea of using open projects like Moodle to 
turn your results into widespread practice. If we can improve the tools that students are using around the world, we have something good going, right? So let me tell you some of the things we're doing in the Moodle project that you may not have known about, that uh, some really interesting new things uh, that help make it a really good platform to invest your time into. So we have a few current initiatives. Uh, we're moving to Europe. I'm not based, we are based in Perth mostly. About a third of our employees are in Europe already. But for me, Europe is the place that uh, cl more closely matches uh, the Moodle project. When you talk about um, the sorts of things I've been talking about, here in Europe, they tend to, uh, they strike a chord. People go, yes. Um, less so in other parts of the world, less so in Australia, less so in, the, in North America. Um, so we are uh, focusing a lot more on doing more activities here and we're moving uh, to we're having a new office in Barcelona with more people there and I'm probably moving here myself. Uh, and we're also starting a Moodle foundation and the Moodle foundation is going to be completely focused on research and innovation uh, around Moodle. We're seeking deeper uh, involvement and that's why I'm here. Right, so we are developing new funding opportunities through, we, we want to be involved in research funding, for example, uh, more business development and networking. I'm, I've been meeting with like heads of other open projects and we're talking more than we ever have, actually. In the past, we're all so busy. We've got our heads down, focusing on our own thing and we're not talking with other projects so much. But we're starting to do that. And I think that's going to be very exciting to see open projects joining together, being integrated, open education resources being available in Moodle by default. Um, uh, just everything more plug and play. I, I like to say just because, say, for example, Google um, have invented Google Docs, well, they, they bought it, but the, that software works terrific. If you've ever used Google Docs for collaborative editing, it's bloody amazing. It's, it's fantastic. And if you're interested, I advise you to look into the papers that they've published on the algorithms for the collaborative editing and how they resolve lag in the editing. It's, a, it's some pretty exciting um, computer science going on in there that makes it just work. You don't care. But just because one company has done that doesn't mean we have to stop developing those sorts of tools. Those sorts of tools should be open. I should be able to throw up my own Google Docs on my own server anytime I want. And there are uh, lots of projects who are working on that. So those sort of open projects, we, we should be making those for education, bringing them together, letting them work so we can build uh, the environments that we need for education. And, and we're working on a lot of new products and I'll, I'll go through some of them now. So, we've got eight I want to tell you about, eight things, and I'm going to go through them now. So the first one is uh, the one you know, just Moodle Core. The, Moodle, the main Moodle software is Moodle Core. And we just released Moodle 3.3. Uh, we have some very good integrations with Google and Microsoft because some people really need them. I hope there'll be more and more open alternatives as we go forward. Uh, and we've been, in general, working on quite a lot of interface stuff, making it look and work better. So you can now just log into a Moodle site by um, using external OAuth accounts. And this can be any OAuth source. So if you have your own authentication source, you can just connect it very easily. Uh, that's what collaborative documents look like. They're embedded. And they're not just embedded in Moodle. We're, Moodle can now control the sharing permissions. So say a student submits one of these documents as an assignment, they will have right access to change that document for, you know, at that point. But as soon as the assignment due date happens, you don't want the, the student still changing the document. So Moodle actually takes the, the uh, rights away from them and gives the teacher write ability instead. 
uh, or all the teachers, or whoever has the permissions in Moodle now also has permissions to that document. So we now mirror the permissions from the Moodle workflow onto those external documents. Just as an example, uh, we've done work on the dashboard, and I had to switch to the iPad here, and it looks like that slide's failed. Oh, well. Let's see. There's actually an animation playing. Oh, it is. It's up there. Okay. There we go. So there's a quite nice new interface is being designed. This is actually uh, a mock-up because, and it looks like the real thing, because we we've, we've now have the approach of designing everything uh, in extreme detail as prototypes first before we give it to developers. This is new for the Moodle project. Normally it's software engineers who just dive straight in. And the way software engineers usually think is they think, okay, what's the data? They define the tables of data, and then they turn that into screens and forms, and you end up with this kind of old-fashioned looking software. Uh, so now we have user interface designers designing the experience first, and we work backwards, and we give it to the developers and say, okay, make that. Um, and that's working a lot better. So uh, this is the, the dashboard showing courses, uh, the present, past, and future. And it's a lot easier for students and teachers to find what to do, what's happening, right? What, what are the things I have to do next? But one of the most exciting things uh, that we're doing right now uh, in Moodle Core is the, our analytics project. So a lot of people working on analytics. Uh, how many people here are working on some form of analytics, actually, on an LMS? Okay, about half of you. So analytics, as you know, is a very broad concept, and, and there was a great talk on the first day about it, and uh, there's a lot of things that you can do. What we've tried to do here is build a platform for analytics research. We've tried to make it fairly generic. I apologize for the quality of this diagram. It's done by... Uh, one of the developers, and I was going to make a new one for this, but I didn't get around to it. But let me take you through it. So you have your Moodle raw data here, and there is a concept of taking a subset of that data out. At that point, there is a number of ways to do that, and there, in Moodle you can make plugins that extract the data. So. It's such a generic idea, that, that, but you can, um, uh, you, can, you can take that idea in any direction you want. At every stage in this uh, process, in the sort of four or five stages, uh, these are plugins and can be designed by anybody or extended or changed by anybody. So we have this idea, uh, you take that data and you have indicators. We're looking for indicators. And those are, again, plugins. They can be changed and designed. And we've done a few, but we're now looking at the community to make a lot of new ones. You make this model data set, and you put this into a machine learning engine. Those machine learning engines, the neural nets, they are also pluggable. So we provide two. One is a PHP one, and one is an external Python one. Uh, and these are separate open projects. But if you have your own preferred uh, uh, machine learning framework you want to use, you can plug that in. We take predictions, uh, those, those predictions that come out, and we're looking for things, you know, we're looking for patterns or we're trying to predict things. For me, the most exciting outcome is you take a prediction and turn it into a notification. Because I'd like to see Moodle be proactive about supporting you with your teaching you're learning. If you're a teacher and you've got a thousand students, you, I want Moodle to tell you, you need to focus on this student right now, or focus on this group of students, or just something amazing is happening in the course. So come and have a look, join in, because instant feedback is very key for education. If you are getting assistance from the tools to come and be a better teacher, then you know, that's, that's our goal. So if you're interested in any of that and you want to know more, that's the URL. Go to Moodle Docs, uh, the English version, and Inspire. It's, we call it Inspire. Uh, in Moodle 3.3, it's an external plugin, so you have to add it, uh, and you can have the functionality and start playing with it. If 
In Moodle 3.4, it'll be built in as core software, and because we've been testing it. Um, and what we've been doing initially is we want that um, the machine learning, the, sorry, the neural net, we want it to come out of the box with some understanding of what online learning is. And so we've been training it. We've been training the default neural net. It's, I think it's, a, well, the, def the ones we have are two-layer neural nets. Um, we've been training it on institution data. And I think we've had five universities so far have given us complete data sets, um, anonymized, of course, uh, so that we can start training these, uh, the brain. And uh, if you want to get involved on that level, we'd love it as well. We, we need real data here to understand what really happens in Moodle sites. For the next couple of releases, actually, we're just focusing on usability. It's so important. Uh, you all use apps like I do, right? And we, we want simpler and easier and quicker interfaces. And so we are really focusing on that. Um, to the point of which I said no new features, read my lips. So um, uh, that's what we've been doing. And you can see over here 3.4 we've got a schedule of just a whole lot of like user interface things. And longer term we're going to continue that. Moodle has so many features already. This is actually the problem with Moodle, it has too many features. And a lot of it about, is just about simplifying it to make it actually, uh, to make those features accessible so people even understand them and people uh, can actually use them. Um, and there's a bunch of other stuff here, but I wanted to talk a little bit about uh, virtual reality. We have a virtual reality room at the Moodle office, uh, and uh, you didn't get to try it when you came. We forgot, Demetrius. Yeah, next time. So. Uh, I love VR. I had a VR helmet in 1996, a VFX-1. made me sick, but I, I love playing with it. And I've been waiting for it to cut to improve, you know, for like 20 years. And uh, it, it really has now. Has anybody here not tried an HTC Vive? Not, not never tried? Okay, I advise you to try one because you may have tried just helmets before, right? Maybe VR helmets. So you put the helmet on. But if you don't have your hands in there, you, it's nothing. Right? You have to have your hands in there. Because this is a room scale thing. So uh, with an HTC Vive and, and other things that are coming along now, you have an area as big as this. You can walk around. You have your, your, uh, your hands can pick up things. You can pick it up. You can give it to somebody else. You can uh, make giant objects and draw them in the air, and you have this immediate feedback, immediate agency in the world, and then you really see the potential. It's, it's mind-blowing. And where we're heading is in the next couple of years, the augmented reality stuff is going to become quite common. So, you know, with a phone and slightly thick glasses, you can get that stuff happening in the real world. And more importantly, in a multi-user real world. So I would love it if I could say, OK, everyone put your glasses on now. And then here on the table, start demonstrating um, some work we've been doing or some models. Or maybe we have a car engine or something and we take it apart. And you know, I can throw a bit over to you. But it's the digital world mixed with the real world. And we can all see it together. Now, I don't see Moodle really in that. I'm not interested in putting Moodle courses as giant blocks that you push around or anything dumb like that. But where Moodle makes sense is that when you have those experiences, if a student has been given a simulation or something to do, if there is any assessment going on in that space, where, do that, where, do, where should that assessment go? It needs to be piped back out to a learning management system into the gradebook. Right? So you had a VR or AR activity in the course. So as a teacher, you then see, oh, here are all my students, and here are all their results for that activity. So there is a new standard that needs to be invented between the apps to some sort of a Moodle app running on the VR headset 
pushing it back to the Moodle site. That's the first part. The second part is, as a teacher, when I see that list of uh, results, I want to maybe see a student. So I go click on a student's name, and zing, my glasses start replaying that experience. And the student is here, and I'm watching them doing a, you know, maybe they're, they're uh, saving a uh, nuclear power plant from meltdown or something. And I can just walk around them, you know, I'm walking around, I'm looking at the student, I'm watching how they're going, and I can be there as part of that highly dangerous virtual experiment um, in that environment. So there's a recording type facility that needs to be developed. And it needs to be an open kind of a standard so that all apps go, oh yeah, if I, want to, if I want this to be used in education institutions, I need to implement these two standards, the, the, the assessment and the recording. And then Moodle and all other LMSs will just use them. All right, second one. These will move faster now. Um, Moodle Mobile. If you haven't seen it lately, I've got it, it happens to be on my iPad now because of the, the internet thing. So our Moodle Mobile app, uh, this is the dashboard. Let's see, this is uh, actually our Moodle HQ uh, Moodle. So this is where we do our internal stuff for the for work. And uh, I can go into a particular course, and you can see what forums look like, and so on. So the app is getting very very capable and has. Um, a lot of great features. One of the things we're doing in the app is actually starting to center uh, the uh, experience around messaging. Most of us are using messaging now all the time, right? How, many, how much of your time in the day is spent inside either WhatsApp or Telegram or Facebook Messenger or iMessage or SMS even, right? More and more. But in an education environment, that chat between students and teachers and, and groups can be connected with activities. So we can talk about an activity and it becomes a link. And when you click on it, it goes into that activity. And so this, already, this all works now already in the app. Uh, and it gives a very good experience overall. Um, the really good thing about the app is it works, it's designed to work offline. So it synchronizes data, and even if you're off the internet, like we could be now, today, uh, you can keep working. You can keep writing forum posts, you can keep submitting assignments, you can do quizzes, you can do SCORM activities. Everything works offline, and when you have internet, it synchronizes back. This is really useful for third world countries such as Australia uh, that have terrible internet, uh, and um, yeah, quite essential. So you can see over the past few releases, we've actually achieved, uh, that's actually old because we now have Moodle 3.3, and we've just, we've just achieved, uh, I think next week, 100% support of Moodle core features in the app. Yeah, the last, two, uh, the last two that we're working on is database and workshop. And you can also skin the app. You can uh, make it look how you want, put your own branding, make it look like your university. And we actually have a service where we do that for people. So for about 3,000 euros a year, we uh, actually can give a university their own app in the App Store with their name and their logo. And when you launch it, uh, it just goes straight into that university. And Moodle Desktop, it'll be just released this week. So we now have the same mo mobile app working on desktops. And you can have a Mac app, uh, Linux, or Windows. The third thing we're working on is uh, Moodle Partner Services. So we have 88 Moodle Partners worldwide. That's how we run this project. And uh, the Romanian Moodle Partner uh, is someone who's here, Cosmo Herman, is sitting there e-learning software, uh, the partners are the ones who pay for Moodle generally, at least in the, in the past. 
And uh, that's, that's how we've been able to function. Did I tell you already, I calculated about $50 million to make Moodle so far. Uh, the fourth thing is Moodle Cloud. We only launched it in July 2015. We only allowed paid sites um, under a year ago. We now have 21,000 Moodle sites running on that thing. So that's been an excellent research project for us. Firstly, how do you host 21,000 uh, pieces of PHP software with 2 million lines of code in it? And we found some very efficient tricks and things to do that efficiently. Secondly, we now have 21,000 uh, sets of data that we can look at. So we can now do reports across all of that activity and see what people are using and how they're using it. So as a source, a source of research for us, it's quite amazing. Um, and we're doing obviously that as ethically uh, as we possibly can, but the idea is to help us improve how Moodle works and improve that for everybody. So that's an example of how our Moodle site looks on, uh, that's my test site on uh, Moodle Cloud. And there's a number of plans that don't interest you too much here, but we, we, we mostly have uh, smaller size websites there. But it's very easy to get one, it's like five seconds. If you just need a test Moodle site to test something, or you want to test the latest version of Moodle, uh, you can get one and it takes literally a minute. So we're doing a lot of work on making this a better system, making it slicker, making it uh, a lot uh, easier, and particularly when you arrive, to walk you through how to use it and, and make sure that you can uh, uh, use it effectively. And we're also building a functionality so that you can upload your Moodle site into Moodle Cloud and you can download your Moodle site out of Moodle Cloud so that you can just use it as a place to store whole Moodles. This one is really important, the Moodle training project. So we already have a, a MOOC that runs on Moodle, and a lot of people use Moodle for MOOCs. Uh, we have one that lasts four weeks, it's running right now, called Learn Moodle. One interesting thing about this MOOC is that you look at the stats of uh, engagement for most MOOCs, and they start off really high with 100,000 people, and they slope down to, you know, maybe at the end you had 3% who actually completed the thing. We have very high engagement right across. Uh, so people stay and they, at the end of four weeks, they have a pretty good idea of um, how to teach with Moodle. It's free. So if you, have, if you want to learn Moodle better, you can come and use it. Or if you want any, uh, any staff of yours you want to recommend to actually use it better, then we, we recommend you come there. What we're doing next is we're actually making a full curriculum uh, for learning Moodle, like a like a degree, like a university degree. So it's broken into modules, and some of the modules are core, and you, should, you have to do them, and some of them are optional. Like you might not be interested in using rubrics, for example, so that's an optional thing. <clears throat> but it's very pedagogically focused. We're showing you how to be a good online teacher, oh, incidentally, with Moodle. The idea is once you, you get enough points, you get a certification. And you've got a certificate, you can say, yes, I'm at a level one or a level two, etc. And we're going to be running this, we're going to be putting this very worldwide. These courses are available from Moodle partners or when you come to a Moodle conference or online. And they all add up and they all could account towards your certification. It's really important because um, what I discovered when I started Moodle was you know, I thought if I put all this functionality that I was working, I was working so hard on making software that implemented these ideas and I was researching it on real students and prototyping in classes and so on and I thought if I make this software work, people are going to use it. But they don't because people are lumps of meat. <laughs> we are, our brains don't just use software because it's put in front of us. It's 90% of the effort of online learning is actually people themselves changing their behavior. 
And so that's why uh, training programs and learning is so important uh, in this area. Number six, Moodle Academy. I already talked about some MOOCs. So we are offering a, we have a, a platform designed for universities that want to have external MOOCs. If you want to have a MOOC that's not on your own IT infrastructure, and it's out there somewhere, more as a marketing thing more than anything, then uh, we have that platform, it's Academy. Um, the, the design of it has been, it's a simplified form of Moodle, but you can take an, any Moodle course and put it in there and it's a simplified form and then you can handle you know, 100,000, uh, 200,000 students um, through a MOOC. What? Three minutes? Wow. Okay, so that's that. We're also building a Moodle community marketplace. Now we have Moodle.org, which is a Moodle site. We have the Moodle Users Association, which is an association of mostly universities who come together and crowdfund core features. I highly advise you join. We have Moodle.net, which is an open education resources sharing place. And we have Moodle plugins, uh, a lot of people who, in the community who build plugins. But what we want to build is a new system to bring all of those things together into a community where you have a Moodle account. We work on things like identity and reputation and trust. The trust is very, very important. Uh, and there's a lot of talk going on about uh, how you become trusted on the internet. Um, this is a place for people to share uh, not only um, ideas with each other and have discussions, but to share content, to share plugins, and to work together on new things. So there's a lot of exciting ideas here, and if you're interested, come and talk to me later today. And lastly, we have a Moodle Foundation, and the purpose of this foundation is to promote research into online learning and to promote the use of that research, not the US, the use of the research globally. Uh, if you are involved in a research project uh, in the EU or elsewhere, and you're using Moodle to, to do that, uh, come and talk to us. You know, if we can consult or be involved at maybe the early stages, we can make that more effective. And maybe we can make it so that, that the results of that project come back into Moodle core and, if, and help more people. Too often, we only hear about things afterwards, and some resulting project has resulted in some software which we can't bring into Moodle core for whatever reason, uh, or isn't useful uh, outside of that project. And it's wasted public money, basically. So we just, we can't be doing that. We've got to be working together. So the foundation's to promote that. So, very quickly, in the end, uh, the future. This is a picture of the brain uh, with all the Latin words translated to English, which I think is quite interesting to see what those bits of the brain are actually called. Um, so uh, the mammillary bodies are literally breast-like things there. You've got the belt, you've got the bark on the outside, the, uh, yeah, all these things. So this education technology will not change. Not for the foreseeable future, anyway. Eventually, we'll be starting to put electronics in there. But for now, that's not going to change. The way you process information through your hippocampus, that's not going to change. Right? When you, there's, that's like a 20-second buffer. And all your uh, sensory input is coming in through this buffer. If you don't focus attention on that information and put it into long-term memory, the brain just forgets it. It falls out the other end of the buffer, like we are a forgetting machine. The nature of organized learning at an institution, these things, that's not going to change. Yeah, you can learn independently. You can break up learning. But if you're going to have an organization for learning, these things are going to stay the same. The idea of a course as a sequence of activities, whether it's virtual reality or what, that's not going to change either. The fact of Moodle being an open source project is not going to change. It will always be open source. It's going to be part of all the other open projects that are around. 
And Moodle as a platform for science will not change. So finally, I just want to give you some, uh, if you uh, are thinking about this, if you're using Moodle already or not, um, how you can use Moodle for your research. Use the platform, use the data in Moodle. Moodle has a lot of data, and if you want to get more, uh, that you can always get more. Um, so for a study, the data is, is essential. Secondly, if you want to have new structures, you can create Moodle plugins to organize that data or to try new techniques. Those plugins, once you do them, can then be shared. And another institution can repeat the experiment and get more data. So you can have very large scale experiments. This is how we extract truth from the universe. Lastly, the an analytics project, we need assistance there. We need as many people as possible trying it and banging on it and improving it because we want to build a platform for analytics where we can try all kinds of new things and share uh, that stuff across the site. If you go to research.moodle.net, you'll find we have a repository of Moodle-related papers. There are hundreds in there and some interesting stuff. Um, as well as links to all the analytics and so on. So, I just wanted to end on the, the point of the, 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 you know, this Moodle project is a, a fire that's growing. Uh, we have a lot of little fires that we're lighting and um, growing. And you all have your own fires. Um, and I, I want us to put our fires together, put our energies together, and uh, see what we can do with it yeah, to help the world a bit. All right, thanks very much. So thank you very much, Martin. Uh, we are sorry that we were not able to allow you more time for your presentation, but we still have some time for some questions and answers. Please, Kinshuk. Uh, very inspiring uh, talk. A um, uh, lot of new things for me. In my past job, we used Moodle in Athabasca University, but now we have Blackboard. And there are talks about changing it uh, however, one of the biggest things that uh, uh, university is looking at is analytics. So one question that I have uh, for you is that are you looking at uh, uh, complying to, for example, Caliper or XAPI or something like that as a standard? And where are we in that? Because that is going to be one of the make or break deals. Absol absolutely. Uh, the data in Moodle is richer than both of those standards. Like it's more fine. Uh, both XAPI and Caliper dumb down the data a little bit, which is fine. Um, so the model behind those is that you have a learning record store. Um, we already have plugins in Moodle so you can extract the logs live and push them to a learning record store where p presumably you will do analytics on it. For me though, it's more interesting to actually suck that data back into Moodle and use Moodle as a learning record store because we have the more detail and do the analytics in the Inspire project. Uh, we, there is work being done on those plugins right now to get the data back. As part of uh, something like LTI, for example, where you have an external activity, you use uh, Caliper to get the data back through LTI, uh, back to the uh, consumer. So yes, we are very interested in that and working on that and being part of that. Uh, we are an uh, IMS member as well. Some other questions? Yeah, Diane. Oh, someone up there. Oh, no. Wave your hand. <laughs> I wonder. There he is. Okay. What is the reasoning of introducing Moodle Desktop? Because it's another application to maintain, and uh, what benefit and feature would bring up uh, comparing to a browser in a computer? Because in a computer, you can use the browser easily. On the mobile phone, yes, it was very hard to browse Moodle and uh, to make well, uh, it. It actually works quite, so there's a couple of reasons. Um, the first one, it's not very hard to make because it is in fact the Moodle mobile app, which is an HTML-based app anyway. 
it's kind of recompiled and repackaged. So it's the same basic software as the mobile app on desktop. Uh, but the advantages of working offline also apply to this app. So you can have your app synchronize, do all your work on your laptop offline and synchronize later. Start synchronized on locally. So for example, you have the mobile app, uh, the desktop app. You log in, do your stuff, and then go offline. Yep. What kind of data it synchronized locally? Your profile, your courses, or? Yep, uh, whole courses, entire courses. All of the resources, the quizzes, the assignments, the databases, the workshops, the glossaries, the forums, everything. And what happens if you made the modification offline? There's actually no modifications that students can make that will impact other students. You can add a new forum post, but a student will not be deleting another student's forum post. So actually it works out. It actually works quite well. The synchronization is, is clean. Thank you. Yeah. Someone at the back there. Hi, very interesting presentation. I was particularly fascinated by your example of the VR and the nuclear power plant. And to me, it sounds kind of strange because we learn with all our five senses, yet yeah. all the digital platforms there are just audio and video. Okay. Yeah. So, for example, in a nuclear power plant, if you walk around, you might want to um, see there's something happening which is wrong because maybe the temperature rises, the humidity rises, there's vibration and haptics. So, um, you know, does Moodle have any plans to actually go into this direction? No, no, not at all. That's not our focus. But, but other people are, and, and there are people working on all of these things. And it's tremendous stuff. Um, so we just want to be the LMS that can talk to those applications. So how are we going to talk to those applications then? Well, there needs to be a new standard that doesn't exist, something like LTI, that pushes the assessment data back into Moodle as a learning record store. Yeah? Here, yeah. But also the recordings, as just to finish off, the recordings are part of that. The recordings are like the more experience of the data rather than just the data. That's why I think it's really important to get recordings right too. Yeah. So thank you very much for your uh, interesting presentation. My question is, have you thought about giving some sort of guidelines, you know, to facilitate uh, making the gamification process on Moodle for educators? Yeah, uh, so gamification is an interesting one. Uh, a lot of people are working on gamification in Moodle. There are plugins that do it. Uh, they have different ideas about what gamification is. For some people, it's a Sony PlayStation uh, with all the XP. Uh, for others, it's a much more uh, low-level involved process of gaming each other on particular activities. And, and people are trying different things, and that's, that's great. It's hard to settle on one thing for core. Uh, I also have a bit of a problem with it in that the external motivation of gamification does not necessarily promote learning all the time. It promotes entertainment and it promotes com completion, but I think if you look at retention, you go, oh, I had a great game. You don't necessarily love mathematics or whatever it was you were trying to do in there. So uh, that, you know, there's obviously, there's both sides on that argument in the literature, but uh, personally I'm studying myself and my family, I think gamification is not always good to add. So you, what you want to try and do is instill a love and a passion for the subject itself, like, a, a, you know, an innate love for that thing. If I could just pick on and that, uh, the yeah. gamification can be used in different ways. Uh, yes. The most important thing I think is to make learning meaningful and that hopefully you will agree with it uh, mm. uh, because if we don't have meaningful learning, that means we will learn to pass the exam, not to actually learn it. And gamification allows you to create that context 
so that in which mean learning can become meaningful so if we think from that point of view then it will not look like external factor but look like how we can actually uh, situate the learning in learners context so that learner actually feels yeah i need this learning for and learner understands means uh, calculus is one good example calculus generally people learn just to pass the exam but if we can actually show the real meaning of it and how it is being used then people will learn it to do that and i think mm. gamification can allow that process thank you yeah i i agree that's that's the goal if you have a teacher who is sensitive to that and implements it wisely then yes great but i think if you had if moodle came out of the box with heaps of gamification tools you would be telling everybody that this is how you teach now and you would have a lot of very bad education so this is why i'm a bit wary about it so okay. finally they got yeah the the microphone got to me i was, I was the first one raising the hand but oh they sorry. ignored me here you know right. <laughs> yeah so you presented a bit of a business model for moodle but moodle at the core is an open source how yeah. open do you plan to keep it it will always be open uh sustainability is the key sustainability of projects is what i'm really all about here because it's fine to get grant funding for three years and spend millions of euros on something, but then what happens at the end of the three years? Now, most universities move on to the next grant and the next project. But this is not a long, this is not a short-term thing. This is a long-term thing, and the economy of the ecosystem needs to be built into the project, and that way it can live for a hundred years and just function, right? So, as an as an organism that's sustainable. So that's very important. Sustainability of, of research is very, very important to me. In science, it's called panarchy. Sorry, what? In science, it's called panarchy. Panarchy? Panarchy? Okay, I did not know that word. Thank you. Okay. All right, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. So, yes, some very small announcements. Uh, we don't have a coffee break at this moment. You should go immediately through the parallel sessions. The coffee break is only at 11 o'clock. The lunch will be in the same place in the Polytechnica restaurant. We prepare a Romanian surprise uh, for you, so try to have those. There are some cabbage rolls which are specific for this side of Europe, so try to have those. This afternoon from 4.30, we will have for one hour the IEEE TCLT meeting in this room. So please come and join us for this meeting and discuss the future of the Technical Committee on Learning Technology where you can all be involved and part of. Then from, you will have one hour break so you can go back to your hotel, change, leave laptops and everything else and come back here in the main parking lots here, you will see mini buses and big buses to go to the vineyard for the conference dinner, where we will also present the certificates and the awards for the best papers and the student travel award and so on. So please join us. But please remember the access to the conference dinner is only for those with badges and for the accompanying persons for whom they, you have paid uh, the fee and we have them on the list, okay? So please have your badge with you, not to cause any situation uh, with the staff. Thank you and enjoy it. And those who forgot, go, please go and pick up your invoices if you need them, because we still have a stack of invoices in the registration desk.